Hi kids, it's Mrs. Fravel. How are you? Good. Good, me too. I'm fine. Okay, today we're going to talk about some basic animal physiology and behaviors. Um, just real basic stuff that uh, you, I thought you might need to know before we start talking about specific animals. So you know the words coming out of my mouth. Okay, off we go. Uh, so we talked a lot about characteristics the first week of school and how animals are categorized by their physical characteristics. So we're going to mostly be focusing one phylum of animal at a time. And the phyla are generally um, animals that are in each phylum or each phylum has basic basic characteristics that will include or exclude an animal from it. And those characteristics usually include these things. So the type of organization the animal has, cellular, tissue, organ, or organ system level. Not all animals have organs or organ systems, okay? They'll also delineate the digestive type, complete gut or incomplete gut, uh, skeletal system, internal or exoskeleton, reproductive system type or type of reproducer. Um, there's also nervous system type. Do they have a centralized nervous system or not? Symmetry. You know the types of symmetry. You better after the candy lab. And thermoregulation. There's a thing we have not talked about. So what is thermoregulation? So in biology, we talked about how proteins drive metabolism. They're the basic, really the basic building blocks of bodies. And if they don't have the right pH or the right temperature, proteins won't work. So uh, pH, if it's too acidic or too basic, that breaks down proteins. Fortunately, pH is generally a function of the environment. So if an animal is in a too acidic or too basic environment, they'll they'll die or get out of it. But the temperature also can affect how proteins work and animals have specific ways of dealing with thermo heat regulation. You know what that means, right? Okay. Um, and that comes in different forms, different physiologies for maintaining optimal temperature. Okay. And again, this is generally by phylum is how these are separated. So the first th thermal regulation strategy I'll talk about is ectothermy. You know what this is. These are cold-blooded animals. They're the same temperature as their surrounding environment. They can warm themselves up and cool themselves down, but they do that not really by internal mechanisms, but by moving and behaviors that they will exhibit that will either um, help them gather heat or help them dissipate heat. So when they get cold, they slow down and they can't move and they can't eat. And that's that's not that's not good for functioning, right? So how do they increase their temperature? Think of any animals that you know that you might see doing some behaviors to warm up that you know are ectotherms, like reptiles. What do they do? That's right. They bask in the sun. They'll go sit on rocks in the morning. So watch out for rattlesnakes when you're hiking in the mornings in our hills, okay? Um, and little lizards. Leave them alone. Always leave wildlife alone, right? Okay. They can also move to a warmer area of their environment. This can be small or large migration, okay? To cool down, they generally will go in the shade or go to a cooler area. So ectothermy is all about behavior. Um, Thermoregulation also includes a weird group called poikilotherms. So these are ectotherms that just have a little wider range of temperatures at which they can function. Um, this is mostly just vertebrates. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, sea turtles are poikilotherms because they travel such a wide range in the ocean. They've got to be able to function in warmer and colder waters. Uh, larger snakes like anacondas, large fish like tuna. Um, there are a couple of insects and arachnids that are mm, kind of almost poikilothermic. And then uh, mammals are almost never poikilothermic. There's two examples, naked mole rats. If you don't know what that is, please go look them up because, oh my heck, they're adorably ugly. And then of course, sloths. And then the third thermoregulation strategy that you know of already is endothermy. These are the warm-blooded birds and mammals and some dinosaurs were also, we're pretty sure, um, endothermic. These have internal metabolic processes that actively keep their internal body temperature warm. You do, okay? Uh, mainly birds and mammals. There's one fish that we know of called the opa that is truly uh, endothermic. Again, do yourself a favor, go look up opa. They're the weirdest looking fish. Um, how is this accomplished? So 
Endothermy is uh, accomplished by these things. We have more mitochondria in our cells than ectotherms. They're just in there being powerhouses forever, releasing more ATP to be used more to keep the body running, right? We also eat a lot more. Mammals eat a lot more than reptiles and fish. And then we have specialized insulation, fat, feathers, and fur keep in the heat. It doesn't escape into the environment. And then we can also move to fire our muscles, which is something that ectotherms do a little bit as well, okay? All right, so as we get out of the phylum level, we start seeing more specific characteristics at each classification level that will uh, define what animals belong in that grouping. So within each phylum in the classes, we start to look at things like appendages and body types um, and sizes and their habitats and life cycles. So within a phylum, we can have several classes that have different legs, different body types, different life cycles. Okay, And then within each class, we get families and orders where we look closer at those physical details. How many toes? do they have? Where are their wings? How many pairs of wings do they have? Things like that. Genus level. Genus genera are cousins. Animals within one genus, they're cousins really. Um, they generally don't interbreed. Sometimes they can interbreed. They look really similar. Um, they just have specific differences that come down to like size and color or maybe where they live. And those constitute the species. And species are animals that can interbreed. They live very close to each other. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that living close to each other is there's exceptions for migration. But uh, then also within each species, there are subspecies. So that's an even better one. Here's an example. All animals in the phylum chordata, they're known for having a backbone, among other things, but that's the big one, right? Within phylum chordata, there are several classes. One class is class mammalia. All mammals have um, fur and four appendages and certain teeth, okay? Uh, carnivores are in order of mammals that have teeth that eat meat, Ursidae is a family within the order Carnivora. Uh, they have big heads, round ears, eyes that face forward, and they can't retract their claws. That makes something a bear. That's a bear. That's it, right? And then within the bears, there are uh, the family Ursidae, and then there's a couple of other families that include pandas and things like smaller sun bears. Uh, Ursidae is the big bears, the big fluffy bottom bears, um, and they are characterized by where they live and what they eat. And then within the genus, or with, within the genus Ursus, we have several species of bear. We have Ursus arctos, which is the brown bear and grizzly bear, Ursus americanus, black bear, Ursus maritimus, polar bear, and Ursus tibetanus, which is the Asian black bear. Okay. But there's more. So what does subspecies mean? There are several different kinds of brown bear. You know, um, here in America, we have brown bears and we also have grizzly bears. So grizzly bears are just a really big subspecies of brown bear. That's it. Okay. And then um, more characteristics that we see mostly on a genus and species level. There are exceptions. And migration kind of applies to bigger groups as well. Okay. So what's migration? Migration is just long distance movement of a population seasonally, meaning they go somewhere and then they come back. They do this to exploit different food resources so that it, they don't completely deplete a habitat of food. They go eat somewhere else for a while, then come back when it's replenished. Uh, they go some, they will migrate to find mates or have their babies. They'll also migrate to warm up or cool down. Um, and then there's several types of migration, long distance, east, west, north, south. There's also local at altitudinal change. Uh, which is something we see here in robins. So robins spend time down in the valley down here, and then they spend time up in the mountains. So they are moving back and forth to exploit different food. That's altitudinal change. And then vertical movement in the water column we see in the ocean. Some fish and squid and things come up during the day, go back down deep during the night. Okay, and here's some examples of animals that uh, migrate. The Arctic tern, this beautiful bird, migrates from the North Pole uh, to the South Pole and back every year. Uh, monarch butterflies, they migrate on, in four generations or five generations from Canada to Mexico. There's a really good movie. I might make you guys watch it. Okay. So here's some more things that animals do that we use to kind of describe who they are. Metabolic shutdowns. There are several different kinds. That just means that they stop working 
to save energy. Um, there's three different kinds. There's torpor. This is short term, usually overnight when it's cold. Uh, these are small animals like birds and small rodents. They go to sleep. They go into pretty deep sleep. They they seem awake sometimes, but they're hard to move. I can't wake my chickens up at night. Brumation is something that a lot of reptiles do during the winter. It gets really cold. They slow down. They stop eating. They stop working, but they're just, they're not really asleep right? Same with hibernation. Hibernation is mammals long-term shutdown for winter. They're not asleep. They're awake. They just don't move, eat, or poop. That's it, okay? Feeding strategies. There's different ways that animals eat. If you don't know what herbivore, carnivore, omnivore are, go look them up. There, you can, as an animal, you can either be a generalist, like a raccoon and some crabs. They'll eat anything. Or you can be a specialist and only eat a few or even just one kind of food. So a koala bear only eats eucalyptus. And then this is a snail kate. It's a kind of hawk that only eats snails. One kind of snail that's really limited, okay? And then we have different kinds of feeding strategies. We have filter and deposit feeding, burrowing, grazing and browsing, predation, foraging, and scavenging. You might wanna pause right now and write those down. Make sure you know them. I'll be right back. Okay. Here's some examples of filter feeders, sessile, sponges and corals, moving, great, uh, whale shark, grazing and browsing, the cutest cows. Uh, gorillas are also browsers. They eat vegetation from trees. Burrowers, sea urchins burrow into coral to eat the coral bodies and some algae. And then earthworms, they're burrowers. They eat as they burrow. And predators, we have ambush predators, which hold really, really still and then boom, jump out at things and chasing predators as well. Okay, whew, that's it. Your assignments, um, go to Canvas. It is the animal husbandry assignment on Canvas. You're going to read this article and there's a couple of videos included with the article. So read it, read it, read the whole thing. And then answer the questions about the reading and the videos, okay? Whew, wow, I talked fast, that was a lot. The video kept trying to cut off. So, uh, Go do your assignment. It's due on the due date that is listed on Canvas. And if you need any help, please reach out to me, but I will probably tell you to go to the module and follow the module. I will have instructions all over the place. You can do it. I believe you read all of the things, all the instructions, all of the stuff. You can do it.